with what I was talking last week about, about the second coming. I had asked you this morning, are you look, looking for the undertaker or the upper taker? Well, you know, I'm getting older. Turn 77. It'll be long, I'll be 80 if the Lord lets me hang around that long. And, uh, but some people make it to over 100. I was talking to the lady that takes blood out of me when I go down to the doctor's office. And, and we were talking about those people back in the Old Testament living to be eight, 900 years old. And she said, well, I don't believe that, that, that it was the same length of the years as ours. I said, well, I believe it was. And uh, I tried to explain a little bit. You know, every place you go, you can witness to somebody, can't you? When you get opportunity, and uh, that's that's the kind of stuff I'll be trying to do. But anyway, I know I'm looking up. I I like the Lord to come, and I just go up. And we talked about that some last week. Now I don't believe we're going to go through the tribulation. Now some people believe you're going to go uh, through half of it. Some think you're going to go all the way through it. And then some think only the super saints are going up. Partial rapture, you know. There's a lot of different views on it. But I told you last week, remember, I think we went up in chapter 4 of the book of Revelation. He says, come up hither. And I think uh, after that on through the book, you don't read about the church here on the earth. And then I gave you some other examples. Remember in the Old Testament about Enoch going before the, the uh, judgment and uh, remember Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot and they come out of Sodom and Gomorrah before the judgment and, and we went through several of those but I'm going to give you one verse here this morning that would uh, be good for you to look at uh, I want you to look at uh, First uh, Thessalonians chapter 5 and look at verse 9 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9 says, For God had not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I think my wrath was put on Jesus, if I'm saved. Amen. And really what the reason for the tribulation is, is to try to get people to turn back to Jesus, specifically the Jewish people, because they'd gotten so far away. He offered them a kingdom, they rejected it. Right. And... Uh, then I wanted you to go uh, to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, down to verse 51. And I think I might even read this to you last week. I don't know. He said, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. I might not die. You might not die. Keep looking up, looking for the blessed hope of the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. We call that the rapture, or we'll get snatched away. The word rapture is not in the Bible, if I can right. find it. But the idea is there. Because right here it says, Behold, I show you mist, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trump shall... Uh, sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality you know I'm mortal right now are you mortal could you drop dead one for the Lord you'd already be dead I the devil probably gotten rid of you by now yeah. I wouldn't trust him yeah. some people do though they need people trust the devil well, there's even devil worshippers. They have their churches. Verse 54. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And he says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding work of the Lord for you, much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And so, I don't know. I think, well, I just keep looking for God and working for God and laboring, and the devil's going to try to get you discouraged and tell you it's not doing any good. It doesn't do any good to lay tracks around places. It doesn't do any good to try to witness to anybody. But if somebody hadn't done something like that, you probably wouldn't be saved. That's right. Isn't that true? So maybe we owe it to some other people to do the same kind of things. Amen. And if nothing else to you, maybe I ought to pray for people that aren't saved, especially if they're family and friends and close to you. And so we get into all these things. But, you know, the church will, I don't believe will go through the tribulation. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10 says, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience. He's writing to one of those seven churches. I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon the world to try them that dwell on the earth, upon the earth. Well, I, I believe my wrath, the wrath that God was going to put on me was put on Jesus. Do you believe that happened when you got saved? Wasn't he the one that paid the price for you to be able to go to heaven? I think he suffered your hell on the cross. <laughs> and uh, so that's one of the reasons. Uh, rapture, rapture is imminent. It could happen any time. They could happen before we get out of church this morning. When that last person gets saved to make up the body of Christ, we'll be gone if we're here then. Uh, and maybe you could lead that person to the Lord. I don't know. Wouldn't that be something? And uh, then when you get to heaven, you look around and say, man, I hope that guy get up here. Paul talked about that. He said that was going to be one of his rewards when he got to heaven to look around and see people that he had told how to get saved that made it to heaven. Wouldn't that be something? And, uh, of course, it would be nice to have a big crowd of them. But it's imminent. It's possible at any moment. Uh, back in the uh, early part of the New Testament, they were expecting Jesus to come right away. Now the revelation, like I said, or the rapture, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 again. Let's go back over there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Let's go to verse 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 1. Jesus is going to come as a thief in the night. Well, I think the rapture takes place. A lot of people aren't going to be looking for Jesus, but if you're saved, you ought to be looking for Him. But to all those other people, they're going to look around and say, where'd all those people go? He'll slip in on them, won't He? And so here, look at this uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. Paul's talked to these people at Thessalonica and he told them uh, about the second coming. And he says, you ought to kind of know this stuff. I've taught it to you. In verse 2, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord is so cometh as a thief in the night. Well, even a lot of Christians aren't looking for it. And you know the lost people aren't. They're too busy probably this morning. I doubt if any of them are in church. Most of them aren't in church that are lost. Go up on the square, they're all up there getting coffee. Uh huh? Or if there's a ball game, they probably went to the ball game. And so they're not expecting him to come. Verse 3 For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. And I read that and I think, well, that's talking about they're going to go into all this tribulation and terrible times. But we got to read on and see what he's really talking about here. Amen. He's talking about the people that aren't saved. Let's look at what we did down to verse 3. Is that where I'm at, y'all? Verse 3. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction come upon them. Well, they don't pay any attention to God. One of these days it's going to slip up on them. Uh, but that'll be the revelation for them. That's uh, at the end of the seven years. 
<laughs> I'm going up at the beginning of the seven years. Remember I had that week left out of the book of Daniel, chapter 9? And uh, that, that's going to be the tribulation period. That's described in Revelation chapter 5 to on toward the end of the, the what, 19? 19, chapter 19. And so then he, let's read a little bit farther here though and see what we can figure out. He says, you are the children of light. Well, I think he must be talking to Christians there. Amen. Are you the children of light? Well, I think Jesus is the one who lights the world up, don't you? He's the light of the world. He goes on, uh, you are the children of light and the children of the day. Uh, we are not of the night or of darkness, but the lost people are the night and darkness. He goes on in verse 6, Therefore let us not sleep, so do others. You know, other people are asleep. They're not looking for Jesus. They're not interested in anything of God. Some Christians are so lax, they're not. Right. Especially the lost people. Uh, for they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. Well, probably they were out partied all night last night. They couldn't make church this morning, right? Of course, they weren't interested in coming to church. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath. See, I got down to that verse 9. He's talking, he's really kind of comparing the saved and the lost people here, isn't he? And the lost people, they're going to get surprised. And when the revelation does come, it's going to be a terrible time for them. For us to be caught up, it's not going to be. We're going to have a wonderful time when we get to heaven. I'm looking forward to going to heaven. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the booth. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, but I can't feel at home in this world anymore. But a lot of people, they don't want to give this world up. They're hanging to, on to it with both hands. Aren't they? They don't want to leave this. They... And really, we in America are so blessed. Even our poor people in America have a lot more than a lot of the people that are in the other countries. And uh, now let's see, I'll figure out where I was at here. Verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, uh, we should live to, uh, together with Him, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. Is it a comfort to you to know that you're going to go up before Amen. the tribulation? But it wouldn't be the other people that's going to slip up on them. And then once we're out of here, things are going to get rough down here. Of course, the first three and a half years aren't as bad as the... But I think the first three and a half will be bad enough. And so you get into people, but the rapture, at the rapture, he comes as a thief in the night. The lost people aren't looking for him. Uh, people disappear. Carol says they're going to say the aliens come and got us. Really? Outer space. They're talking about that stuff now, aren't they? <laughs> Those unflying, uh, unidentified flying objects. That, but then in the Revelation, Revelation chapter 1 verse 7 says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Amen. Now, it can't be described in the same thing. One time he comes as a thief as a night. Well, I think that's the rapture, and the Christians go up. But then when you get to Revelation 1 7 says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth uh, shall wail because of him, even so, amen. Even the Jews are going to recognize who he is when he comes. Read the book of Zechariah and you'll find that. That's right. They'll say, what are those nail prints in your hands? The He'll say, I got them in the house of my friends. So I think there's a difference in the rapture and the revelation and there's seven years in between it. Amen. And that's that last week that Daniel talked about. And uh, also I wanted to mention something. Well, let's go on. I don't want to get into that. Um, 
Halo. Get off of that one now. You know, I don't uh, know about you, but I'm just expecting to be nice if I just go up right now. Wouldn't make me mad. Amen. Uh-huh. But now some young people, now Casey up here said, no, Lily and I haven't been married very long. We'd like to have a nice house. And, but on the other hand, I'm thankful. I believe Casey's ready to go if the Lord does come. And I think he'd be willing to leave that house behind because the Lord would give him a mansion in heaven. Uh-huh. But yet there are some things in this world that are good. Not everything's bad, isn't that true? That's right. And we ought to make the most of the blessings God gives us. I don't think he wants you to live in misery. I think he wants you to have life and have life more abundantly. Amen. Well, I think it's more abundant when we get to heaven, but I think... Uh, as a Christian, you're living a more abundant life in this world. You're not out getting drunk on, uh, on drugs. and That's right. That's You'll right. probably go home go to bed at night and rest. We're saying you might have to go to work on Monday. <laughs> but, well, baby, you ought to be thankful you got a job. If you can pay the bills. But uh, I, I really want to now go into, when we get up to heaven... Um, and there's other verses that I could have given you that uh, but I what's going to happen when we get up to heaven we go up in the rapture and then what's going to happen when we get to heaven I think that's a good question we just going to sit around there for seven years and do nothing well of course now Manny already told us this morning at just a few minutes now I I meant to ask him, but he was running a little late. Now, how did you calculate calculate that? Um, so a day unto the Lord is a thousand years. Yeah. So that's your ratio. One day is a thousand years, right? Yeah. So you do seven years times one day is a thousand, so seven divided by a thousand. One day is twenty-four hours, so times twenty-four. One hour is sixty minutes times sixty minutes. You do that, you get like ten point zero eight minutes. 10.0, so it's 10 minutes. Yeah. Almost 11. 0.8. Yeah, rounded point, out. like 0.08, so it's like. But, but it doesn't matter. But it doesn't matter. I just wondered, <laughs> I just wondered how you count. Dimensional it. analysis. But okay, so you know, I think it'll be different so when we get like, to heaven. Yeah. But uh, when we get to heaven, I, I think the first thing when we get up there, there'll be a judgment. You know, Christians are going to be judged. But it won't be as to salvation. You wouldn't be there if you weren't saved. They'll be as to how you lived your Christian life after you got saved. And it's called the judgment seat of Christ. Although I sometimes call it the Bema seat judgment, I think many likes the judgment seat of Christ better. That is in the scripture. And uh, we'll be judged as to how we live and we'll gain rewards or lose rewards. You might get a bigger mansion. Uh, or you might get a smaller mansion. Right. Of course, it doesn't get, it get in a whole lot, but I, I think there'll be different rewards in heaven and loss of rewards. And I think there's going to be degrees of punishment in hell or the lake of fire because they'll be judged too as to their works. But if they're at the great white throne judgment, they're lost. So it's just how much they'll be punished, and it won't all be the same. But I wanted to, uh, of course, you all, we always go to 1 John uh, chapter 4, verse 13. It says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Well, if I thought I was going to go through the tribulation, I think it'd be troubling me a little. But I believe I'm going to heaven, so it doesn't trouble me. So, and now that, so I'm not afraid to read through the book of Revelation. Amen. But some That's people right. are. Because they think they're going to go through all that mess. And then in, in the next verse, uh, it says, In my Father's house are many mansions. You're going to get a man being, living in a mansion in heaven? That's what it says, isn't it? And Jesus went back to heaven and he's getting us a place ready. He goes on, If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, though you may be, 
Also, everybody here has heard me say that over and over and over, haven't you? You can probably almost quote it. Uh -huh. But the thing is, when we get up there and you know, go to heaven uh, at the rapture, I, I think there'll be a wedding. I think there'll be a wedding. Well, who's the bride and who's the groom? Well, the church is the bride and Jesus is the groom. And somebody says, well, is there any scripture for any of that? Well, there must be, or I probably wouldn't have said that. <laughs> and uh, so a few places I wanted to take you and uh, read about some of this. Uh, look at uh, Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. A little bit. <coughs> now, I like these verses. They have to do with, you know, now Carol got up in the middle of the night to see the royal wedding. Because they're on different time than we are. You, you saw several of them. And uh, a lot of ladies like seeing weddings, don't they? And they see what the bride's dress looks like. And, and uh, Really, who's the center of any wedding? The bride. The bride. When she comes down the aisle, everybody stands up and looks. They don't pay attention to the groom. About the only one that pays attention to a groom is the, his mother. Uh -huh. And uh, so I want to look at Ephesians chapter 5 now. And let's skip down here. I don't want to read all the way through here. So for the sake of time... Uh, Let's go down here to verse 22. Ephesians 5, verse 22. And it says, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord. You think maybe if we're the bride of Christ, we ought to submit to Christ? And the husband and the wife down here, it's just a little picture of that. Isn't that what the way it works out here? And it'll tell us that as we go on. Verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even Christ, as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ so loved the church and gave himself for it. Did Jesus love the church very much? He died for it. How much could you love somebody more than to die for them? And he's using a comparison here. And uh, so verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with washing of water by the word. Of course, you could get into some things. Washing in the water, I believe when you study the Bible, it'll clean you up. Amen. It's the word. And it washes you. And uh, somebody says, well, you know, if you pour water through a, a pour water through a strainer, it just goes right through. But will the strainer be cleaner? Uh -huh. So if we pour the Word of God through you, you think it could clean you up any? Well, of course, sometimes when kids take baths, of course there's water, but sometimes they don't use soap. Uh -huh. It is good to have some soap too, right? But it's kind of hard to get cleaned up without water and the water of the Word. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water uh, by the word, that he might present it himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should uh, be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man. Uh, Ever yet hateth his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. Does the Lord nourish and cherish you? Maybe we'll to love him back a little bit. Verse 30, thirty: For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife and they too shall be one flesh well I think that kind of uh, hurts some of these people that are into this homosexual stuff and transgender stuff 
And he says, now look at verse 32. It's an important verse. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So is the church <coughs> the bride and Jesus is the bridegroom? I think that's what it's teaching us here. You think that do these verses seem to tell you that or not? And he's doing a comparison. This is a, a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverends her husband. Should a husband and wife love each other? Well, yes, because God set us an example. Jesus loves his bride, the church. He even died on the cross to save us. He's given us his word in the Holy Spirit to help clean us up. And uh, so another thing I wanted to talk to you a little bit about and point out to you is uh, how a Jewish wedding works. <coughs> how uh, There's three parts to a Jewish wedding. And so I wanted to give you some of that. And because uh, I think it's kind of a picture like this thing we just read. Okay, in a Hebrew wedding, there's three parts. Reve I'll read Revelation Chapter 19, verse 7, I want to read that one verse. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. Are you making yourself ready? Well, you're coming to church. I think that's making yourself ready, don't you? Amen. Reading your Bible, praying, witnessing to people. That's getting ready, isn't it? And then when the Lord does come, he'll reward you for that. That's at the judgment seat of Christ or the Bema seat judgment. I, I say Bema seat. You know, they have the Olympics and you get, of course, they just get a wreath crown way back in Greece. But uh, I think the Lord will reward you different than that. And, uh, you know, you can have gold, silver, precious stones or wood, hay, and stubble. If you throw it in the fire, the wood, hay, and stubble will burn up. A lot of the works that people have will burn up. Christian works. But the gold, silver, and precious stone will go through the fire. Right? So then Manny can go into what all those... I think he's already been to that once. But, uh, but I wanted to talk a little bit about this Hebrew or Jewish wedding. The marriage was arranged by the parents. Do you think God the Father arranged the marriage? Well, he sent the Son. That's right. Yep. John 3 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting, everlasting life. life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be <coughs> saved. Did the Father set the wedding up? You think he had anything to do with it? Well, that's the way the Jewish people did it. The parents set the wedding up. That's the way it was with Joseph and Mary. The parents set it up. And uh, then the second st step of it, then the groom went to prepare a place for, uh, uh, in the Father's house for him and the bride. Now, is Jesus up in heaven preparing a place for him and his bride? Well, I already gave you the verse. Anybody know what it'd be? <coughs> First John 14 again. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to, right? Is he up there getting you a place? Amen. Are you his bride? Is he going to be up there with you? Does it does, it, does it, this tie together and make sense to you? Makes sense to me. Guess where I got it? Out of the Bible. Amen. I was listening to a guy debate about parts of the Bible, and, and, and he was debating this liberal guy, and the liberal guy says, oh, I know it says that, but... That's not what it means. It means what it says. Well, then the third time. Next, the groom came to claim the bride, and there was a marriage up in heaven. Does, does at the rapture Jesus come to claim the bride? Then he'll take you up to heaven. Will there be a marriage? There'll be a judgment first. That 
And then after the judgment, I believe there'll be a marriage. And uh, that'll all happen in heaven. Then I think when we come back down to earth at the end of the tribulation, at the revelation, that uh, there'll be a, a supper. And, uh, you know, they'd have a big meal. Then I guess you could say maybe in a sense you have a hundred, a thousand year honeymoon. The millennium, right? I guess you could, how you want to look at that. But I don't know, really, uh, I wanted to give you something here and I wanted to show you something. Uh, during the tribulation, uh, will the Holy Spirit be here? Will it be working? Mm -hmm. And I'll, I wanted to give you a few verses on that. And I, I'll uh, try to tie some of this together for you. There's a whole bunch of stuff I thought about. I think about a lot of things, how to get it across. Um, Well, let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm going to go over there and read. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now, 1 and 2 Thessalonians have to do with the second coming. And so that's Jesus coming. And he taught these people. Somebody come in and start teaching them false doctrine. And so then he writes another book and tries to help them get that straightened out and he keeps referring back to the fact that uh, that they should already know these things. But I want you to look at uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and let's go to verse 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of the Lord. What's he talking about? Jesus coming? coming out of the Lord. That's pretty plain, isn't it? Jesus Christ. And by our gathering together unto Him, are we going to gather together unto Him when we go up in the rapture? I think we'll have some services up there. You think we have any church services in heaven? I'd like to hear the singing. It'd be nice to hear Jesus preach. I think He'd, uh, he'd do a lot better than preachers down here that ye be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. In other words, they've been told, uh, rapture took place and you missed it. Now, I don't know if they had a letter written to them. Somebody was teaching it to them. Verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. And so, uh, I, I think that the, he's talking about when the revelation part of it comes at the end of the seven years, the Antichrist is going to have to be revealed. And that's how you'll know that about the revelation, he, uh, not the rapture. The verse 4 says, Who opposeth and exalteth himself. So here's the Antichrist comes on the scene at the end of the the uh, tribulation and I, I wanted to well, let's read on that down here a little bit more. <clears throat> who opposed and exalted himself above all that is called God that is worshipped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God remember ye not that when I was yet with you I told you these things and now ye you know uh, what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. Well, what's holding back the Antichrist coming right now? The church. Well, now some people say it's the government. <laughs> they got laws. <laughs> Roman government had laws. Matter of fact, our laws are based on the Roman laws. But you know, the problem is we're not even enforcing our laws. We have any problem enforcing the laws in America today. So the government might or might not hold something back. But I don't think he's talking about that here. You know what's holding the th uh, sin back in the world? You guys. The Holy Spirit's living in you. 
Otherwise, who would stand up and say anything was said? Lost people don't. It's hard to get them to say they're a sinner. <clears throat> Isn't that the truth? And so remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now ye know what withholdeth that he might uh, be revealed in his, his time, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. When the rapture takes place and all the saved people go to heaven, you think sin will break out a lot worse into the tribulation? Well, right now I think a lot of people like get rid of us. Because you tell them it's not right to go out and get drunk. You probably tell them it's not right to smoke cigarettes. Now I'll throw this one in. I shouldn't probably, but I'm going to get myself under conviction. It's not right to eat too much or not eat healthy food. Huh? But people say, oh, you guys are just old fashioned. No, we believe the Bible and we try to go in there and tell people what we. I, I don't think that people will just be living together or cheating on their husband and wife. Is that taught in the Bible? What oh, about the Ten Commandments? You're not supposed to lie or steal or bear false witness? Aren't all those in the Ten Commandments? But, you know, we've got a lot of lawbreakers. You know who the biggest lawbreaker of all will be? The Antichrist. You think he's going to care what kind of laws the government sets up? I don't think he'll care one bit. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. What the, at the revelation, when he comes down to the earth, will he take the Antichrist out? Now, you know, the only, only, only one that could be strong enough to stand up to the devil and the Antichrist and the false prophet be God. Amen. It would be God. Now, how do you, when the devil comes and tempts you, what do you have to help you to resist it? Scripture. Two things. Scripture's right. Amen. But who brings the Scriptures to your mind? Amen. The Holy Spirit that's living in you. But then when all of us go out of here, it's going to get bad. And the Antichrist, he's not going to care about any laws. He won't care what the government says. Matter of fact, he'll be the. We got a lot of politicians today that believe they're above the government, above the law. Am I making it up if you listen to the news? Some of them play in the stock market because they have information, inside information, what to buy and what not to buy. And they get rich. You got all these lobbyists up there paying politicians off to vote the way they want them to vote. Huh? Yeah. They're professional politicians. I think it'd be better if you had term limits. But see, they get to vote their own raises. So they're not going to vote to term limit them. <coughs> I don't want to get into all that. Let's just leave that alone. I give you a verse. 1 John 4 4. 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen. So who could stand up against the devil or the Antichrist or the false prophet? And you even need the Holy Spirit for you to resist the devil. Don't you? And the Word of God. Revelation chapter 13, verse 4 says, And they worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast, that, and the Antichrist is the beast. And they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Jesus can. The Holy Spirit can. And the Father can. 
In other words, God can. All three of them are God. You know, as some teach, the Holy Spirit's just an influence. Well, I think He's a God's influence. I'm caught up in the wires here. <laughs> I got untangled, though. The devil's trying to tangle me up. He ever try to tangle you up? Huh? You say, Lord, help me. You ever have to say, Lord, help me? Amen. It's tempting to... Then Galatians chapter 5, verses 16, 17, and 18. I want to read that. This I say, then walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Verse 17. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that, that, that ye cannot do the things which ye would, but if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Can the Lord help us? Does the Lord help us to resist? And once the Christians leave out of here, there'll be less of resistance against the Antichrist. But then I want to tell you some, some other things here. Well, in Genesis chapter three and verse uh, Genesis chapter six verse three says, uh, "And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years." That's talking about before the flood. And if you back then the Holy Spirit was working, and He worked different in Old Testament, I believe, than in the New, but He worked. Amen. And it says, "My Spirit shall not always strive." Noah was out there trying to get people saved. What he preached 120 years, how many did he get saved? He didn't get any saved. God did. <laughs> but if you're counting it, you say he did eight. Well, seven, not counting himself. I guess be seven. Him and his wife. So his wife and his three sons and their three wives. So that's six and one makes seven. I'm assuming he led his wife to the Lord too. And after 120 years? Now, I want you to know, the Holy Spirit lives in you. There's scripture back me up. First Corinthians chapter twelve, verse thirteen says, For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether it be Jews or Gentiles, whether it be bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. So when you got saved, you become part of the body of Christ, the Holy Spirit's living in you. Then another one, first Corinthians chapter three, verse sixteen says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Does God live in you? And if you go to the Gospel of John, it says we live in Him. That's right. In Him I live and move and have my being in Acts. You know, when we leave this world, it's going to get better. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 says, What know you not that the body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? Well, I'm saved. I belong to God. Well, other people, well, I'm my own man. Well, you wouldn't even be here if God hadn't put you here. Right. Now, will the Holy Spirit be working, though, during the tribulation? I don't think He'll work like He does now, but there's going to be 144,000 witnesses that witness all over the world. And there will be all, a lot of people get saved. But if they get saved, there's a good chance they're going to die. <clears throat> because if they get saved and they start living for God, they won't take the mark of the beast. They won't be able to buy or sell. They could starve to death and nothing else. Right? right? And if you go to the judgment of nations, I, I think some other people will maybe help them to get through when people, other people get saved. They'll help those Jewish witnesses. Then there's the two witnesses, the last part of the tribulation. And you can get into who they are, but I'm not going into that this morning. But what I want to show you here is, yes, during the tribulation, there will be a whole bunch of people saved, but I don't think it will be people that sit in Baptist churches week after week and rejected Christ and rejected Christ, and they were left behind, and then they get saved in that seven years. But people that haven't heard, I believe they'll get saved. Can get saved. I put it that way. 
And if you want my proof to the, for that, I go to, I think it's first, uh, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, is it? Yes, sir. And you read that and study it, and you'll see what I'm talking about. But right well, now, I want you to look at Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7, verse uh, 13 to 15. Revelation chapter 7, verses 13 to 15. And one of the elders answered. Now here John's seeing these visions. And I think an angel probably. and Somebody's telling, interpreting the vision for John. That's what's going on. And one of the elders answering, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? You think we're going to have white robes when we get to heaven? Uh, you know when a bride comes down the aisle, they wear what color? What's the white stand for? Purity, righteousness, holiness. Right? God wants a pure, righteous, holy bride too, don't you think? Huh? Of course, He's the one that helps us to be that. And so we're reading on. I read part of that verse. Uh, Arrayed in white, and whence came they? Verse 14. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest... And he said to, turn the page here. So John's telling this angel, he says, well, you know, you know what the answer is. Angel's asking John, and John's turned it back to the angel. Well, you tell me kind of what he's saying here, isn't it? And uh, so I want to, where did I leave that off? We're reading Revelation chapter 7, verse 13 to 15, and I got down here, I was reading on verse 14, and it says, And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest, and he said to me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation. Now the great tribulation is the last half. It gets worse than the last half. And, uh, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Will there be a bunch of people get saved? And I, I think if we go over here, and let's, I'm going to go to that because I want to read some more verses. I think it talks about there's multitudes from every nation and kindred and tongue. And so there's all kinds of people get saved during the tribulation. So apparently the Holy Spirit at least is working in that sense that People get saved, don't they? Oh. You know, it's hard to get a new Bible working. Um, Revelation chapter 7, let's go to that. That's where we're here, probably already at. I had that written out, and I want to read a little bit more. I got down to what, verse 14, 15 in there. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation, have washed their robes, made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serving him day and night in the temple. I think their soul and spirit's going on to heaven and they're up there worshiping God. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them and they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them anymore. In other words, they're not going to be down here suffering through the... You know, that's something. When our loved ones die and they're saved, they're in a better place. And this is what this is teaching in a sense of that too. Verse 17, For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them into living fountains and waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And so they're going to be in heaven, but a bunch of people will get saved during the tribulation. The Holy Spirit will be working in that sense. But once the church leaves, I think that will kind of open the door for the Antichrist to make it a whole lot more wicked here on the earth. And it's going to be a terrible time. I'm thankful I don't believe I'm going to be here. And I think I have Scripture to base that on. 
And so instead of reading the book of Revelation and being afraid, read it and believe you're going to go up in the fourth chapter, you're going to be up there with God. But then the ones that do go into the tribulation, some of them will get saved. And then you'll get into the judgment of nations going into the millennium. And I don't want to get into all that this morning. I don't know you think I ought to go into any of that or am I just confusing everybody? I got one more week before uh, Brother Noble comes. Next week it should be. It's Palm Sunday, isn't it? What happened on Palm Sunday? <coughs> Jesus come riding into Jerusalem on a little white donkey. I was going to show you there's two white horses in the book of Revelation. You don't want to mess with the first one. The second one's Jesus. But the devil copies the Lord a lot of times. And you, and you got to, don't get deceived. And there's a lot of people that are telling people the wrong way to be saved. <coughs> you know the most popular way for people to get saved? What is the proverb says, there is a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Most people, I believe, think that if they're Christians, they'll say, I'm not Christians, but thinking about being one, they'll say, well, if my good outweighs my bad. Well, your good might outweigh it's your bad, I, but I don't think that would be enough to get you into heaven. I think Jesus is going to have to get you in. He said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man come to the Father but by me. me. Not your good works, not your baptism, not your church membership, but by putting your faith and trust and realizing Jesus' blood washed away your sins. And He took our wrath on Himself that's why I don't believe I'm going into the tribulation. But some say, well, that just means we're not going to go to hell. But I think if you could study the language, you'll find out it's talking more about not just not going to hell, it's that we won't go into the tribulation like I gave you there in Thessalonians and some of the other places. Let's all stand.